The internet is filled with videos and posts on who discovered the Americas first. The Chinese, Mali, the Romans, the ancient Jews, the Japanese, the Indians, the Crusaders, the Irish, the Egyptians, and others have all been credited with making their way to the Americas. Sometimes these are based on vague passages, sometimes on evidence that sounds plausible at first glance. Like there was tobacco found in the stomach of Ramesses II, but on further inspection with this example, the mummy had been opened up and moved several times in the 19th and 20th centuries. But there is a bit of a fascination with proving a country made it to America first, almost like it's the peak of civilization. So generally, I avoid these claims, but here I'm starting to believe that the ancient Phoenicians circumnavigated Africa hundreds of years before the Portuguese did. But first I'd like to thank Bloodline, Heroes of Lithas, for sponsoring this video. This is a hero collector fantasy RPG in 3D graphics. In the game you can collect champions and build kingdoms, but most unique of all, you can also create legendary heirs of your houses by combining the forces of various bloodlines such as orcs, lycans, demons, and dragonborn. So collect champions, allow them to build up intimacy with their companions, and then produce powerful offspring. So marry into different bloodlines and develop a huge family tree with unique abilities based on their combinations. For instance, you could start off with the Lycanus, a werewolf clan of assassins, then marry into the Karg, who can transform into dragons. In fact, you can use my link to get one of these Karg for free, and together produce some amazing heirs. Or you can also get a half dragonborn, half demigod heir when using my link as well, and these are a particularly rare hybrid, so they will be unstoppable rulers of your kingdom as you begin to grow it. If you want to get involved and download the game, which is free on Android or iOS, use my link in the description or scan the QR code shown on screen. And with this you can get an exclusive starter pack worth $20. This will include 20 intimacy packs, 100,000 gold, and 100 diamonds. So you'll get a hell of a head start when building your empire and your family tree on Bloodline Heroes of Lithos. For those of you who don't know, the Phoenicians lived in ancient Lebanon and were fantastic sailors. They created a sea empire of sorts and also colonies as far away as Carthage, the same Carthage that Hannibal belonged to and attacked Rome with elephants via the Alps during the Punic Wars. The term Punic in fact comes from the Latin word for Phoenician, so these two terms, Carthaginian and Phoenician, are almost interchangeable. And although the locals refer to themselves as belonging to the city they were from, like Tyrian, the foreigners called them Phoenician based on their most important export, purple dyed clothes. Otherwise, they taught the rest of the Mediterranean how to make wine, and they brought their alphabet to the rest of the region. You can actually see how a lot of their letters gradually morphed and transformed into the Latin alphabet we use today. They would also control trade throughout the ancient age, and produced some of the best explorers of the time. Himlico, for instance, was the first to set sail out of the Mediterranean and north, discovering Britain. While the most famous explorer was Hanno the Navigator, who journeyed along the West African coast. He in fact travelled so far south that he made it to Central Africa and encountered gorillas. As he wrote, he found an island full of savages. Most of them were women with hairy bodies, whom our interpreters called gorillas. Although we chased them, we could not catch any males. They all escaped, being good climbers who defended themselves with stones. However, we caught three women who refused to follow those who carried them off, biting and clawing them. So we killed and flayed them and brought their skins back to Carthage. For we did not sail any further because our provisions were running short. Here he seems to have mistaken gorillas for a hairy human. And when gorillas were finally rediscovered, they used the name that was given to them by this ancient explorer. But when discussing the circumnavigation of Africa, the account in question comes from Herodotus. He wrote, So the Phoenicians set out from the Red Sea and sailed the Southern Sea. Whenever autumn came, they would put in and plant the land in whatever part of Libya they had reached, and there await the harvest. Then, having gathered the crop, they sailed on, so that after two years had passed, it was in the third year that they rounded the pillars of Heracles and came to Egypt. There they said, what some may believe, though I do not, that in sailing around Libya, they had the sun on their right hand. 
So even within this account, Herodotus dismissed their claims. And other Greeks did show that they had absolutely no record of what lay to the south of Africa. As Polybius wrote, but as no one up to our time has been able to settle in regard to those parts of Asia and Libya, whether the continent is continuous to the south or is surrounded by the sea, none of us as yet knows anything. And anything we can ever know must be the result of further exploration. This means in the best case scenario, even if the Phoenicians made their way around the coast of Africa, their information was dismissed by the other ancients. But what made Herodotus suspicious of the account almost backs up that the sailors actually did it. He said that the claim that the sun was on their right hand almost disproves their stories. But what he's talking about here is that the sun's path would actually be far to the north as opposed to the south, as Herodotus in the northern hemisphere would have known it to be. Of course, the ancient Greeks would have known that the sun's path would change throughout the year, but maybe he just didn't believe that the bottom of Africa was so far south that the sun's path changed so much. But obviously this isn't enough to prove the theory that sailors sailed around Africa in ancient times, and there are skeptics to the claim, notably Alan B. Lloyd. He puts forward a lot of reasons as to why this couldn't have happened. For instance, he argued against why any pharaoh would sponsor such a journey. He said if an Egyptian king at any period organized and dispatched an expedition, he did so for practical ends, to meet specific practical needs. Disinterested inquiry or plain curiosity were always amongst the least evident of Egyptian habits of mind. What possible end could an Egyptian king have thought an enterprise of this sort might have served? And he goes on to say that sailors in ancient times would not go on such a risky journey. Mariners and sail were, with good reason, a conservative breed. It would surely be impossible to find in the entire annals of maritime exploration in ancient or modern times more foolhardy behaviour. Why run such risks? Now this may have been true for a great deal of ancient history, however, this particular period in history was prime for such exploration. The journey was supposed to have taken place during the reign of Necho II of Egypt, who ruled from 610 to 595 BC. Herodotus himself actually wrote, Libya shows clearly that it is bounded by the sea, except where it borders on Asia. Necho II, king of Egypt, first discovered this and made it known. When he had finished digging the canal which leads from the Nile to the Arabian Gulf, he sent Phoenicians and ships, instructing them to sail on their return voyage past the Pillars of Heracles until they came into the Northern Sea and so to Egypt. Here he also mentions the canal that Necho started to build, but really we're not too sure when it was completed. This was a precursor to the Suez Canal and it survived until the rise of Islam, connecting the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. So clearly Necho did have some ambition to unite the seas or at least begin trading with foreign lands. Now it is true that most Egyptian pharaohs really didn't seem particularly interested in sea voyages, but the same could also be said for Chinese emperors. However, then somebody like the Yongle emperor comes around and sponsors Zhang He to explore the Indian Ocean. Well, the same was pretty much true for Necho, who we do know recruited displaced Greek Ionian sailors to build a navy. Plus, Necho would have wanted to keep trade routes open with the land of Punt, and he was a conqueror himself. In fact, his wars were even mentioned in the Bible. As it says in Kings 23, while Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle, but Necho faced him and killed him at Megiddo. Necho's main wars in the region were directed against the expanding Babylonians, who, under Nebuchadnezzar, decisively crushed the Egyptian forces. Yet, here in Egyptian history, there was a king who built a navy, was interested in trade and conquest, so he seems like a plausible candidate to sponsor such an expedition. Then there's the idea that sailors wouldn't embark on such a journey, but this also can't really be argued when discussing the Phoenicians, as there's obviously Himliko and Hanno as mentioned before. But there's also Eudoxus of Cyzicus, a Greek sailor who, in the 2nd century BC, was sailing between Egypt and India. One day he was blown off course and found a shipwreck along the African coast. After listening to the natives and analysing the ship, he concluded that it had travelled from the Mediterranean via the southern coast of Africa. 
When discovering this, he tried to emulate the journey, but disappeared en route. So we can add Eudoxus onto this list, and the poor sailors who were shipwrecked off the coast of Africa. Then even Alan B. Lloyd gives the example of the Persians attempting to make the trip as well. In fact, even after Herodotus talks about the Phoenicians, he tells the story of Satasbus. He had been condemned to death for kidnapping the daughter of the governor of Babylonia. He was tasked with circumnavigating Africa. After months at sea, he returned home in failure, but he did reportedly discover a dwarfish race who wore a dress made from the palm tree. This could well have been the pygmy people of Central Africa, or maybe he just made up the story to save his own life, it's hard to say. But it shows that at least a few people were out looking for a route around the continent. And even Lloyd admits that the times mentioned would make sense. The journey would have been around 24,000 kilometers, so sailing 12 hours a day at 5 knots, well, it would have taken between 2 and 3 years. This would have also included the time they took to farm crops somewhere in the south, something that the Phoenicians as colony builders would have been completely used to. Plus, on the Red Sea, they could have caught the monsoon wind south, and then the different currents make the journey perfectly manageable even for ancient ships. This journey is so manageable on ancient ships that Philip Beale in 2008 built a replica of their ships and did the journey himself using only equipment from that era. So he proved that such a journey was perfectly possible. This means that the attitude of Necho and the Phoenicians seems right, the timings were right, it all seemed manageable, and the reports match up with the reality of the continent. So maybe, just maybe, the ancients sailed around the bottom of Africa hundreds of years before the Portuguese did. But do you know of any other often dismissed claims of ancient exploration that I should look into? Maybe you believe the claims that Marley discovered the Americas seem perfectly plausible, but leave them in the comments below.